Welcome. Nice to see you all. It's always nice to see you. Always encourage me. When anybody shows up, it's encouraging. Well, now, you know, my uh, my wife being my uh, foundation, um, when she's not able to be with us, it makes me feel unsteady, kind of unsteady on my feet right now. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I, I just feel unsteady. She's not here. But she is on Zoom, so that's a small comfort. So here's the plan. You have the text for tonight's presentation. Call it a lecture, if you will. Especially if you've had a chance to read it through beforehand. Um, feel free to interrupt at any point if there's when we come to a passage or a, a statement uh, that you would like clarified or if you'd like expanded uh, that you're not clear on. Um, but my thought is, my expectation is that um, the full force of what we're talking about here in the, with principles two and three is not going to hit us until we start getting into the practicum, practicum two at the end. Um, and um, even then, with the practicum, my expectation is that um, the practicum, by the way, is not a test. It is... Um, how would you call it? It's a hole. And its intention is to, um, to dig up the soil of our mind and get us uh, thinking and, and to sow some seeds more deeply into the soil of our mind. And for that, you'll need my help. But my hope is that as we work through the practicum, um, with this presentation as the background, um, things will start to open up to you. That and and I hope will start to hit you, um, as uh, as much as I as much I dare say as it hits me. I very I, I enjoy sharing with with you all the things that I'm learning uh, from, and I'm always learning. Um, my mind is never at rest, and I think that's the way it is when you're studying the theology of the Orthodox Church. The mind is never at rest. You come to one insight, but that insight does not stop. That just becomes the stepping stone for the next insight. You think you've reached the top of the ladder, but you, you reach the top of the ladder, and after a little bit, you look, you say, oh, the ladder keeps going. And so you find that, you know, you just keep climbing, climbing, climbing. Um, with, in, in the, uh, as you continue to learn the mysteries of the faith. So... Let's begin here uh, reading the text, and again, feel free to, to pause, interrupt me uh, and ask questions or for clarification at any point. We're not going to get through this tonight. I anticipate that we'll be going over this tonight and next week, at least, maybe even three, three weeks. But at least I want to get through the presentation tonight, and then we'll start the practicum uh, uh, whatever what, whatever time we have left for this evening, we'll start the practicum, and then we'll continue it next week. But it's really at the practicum that things I expect are going to start coming together. All right, so our overarching theme in the classes of this winter semester is the way back to the tree of life. Allow me to make two prefatory remarks about this, primarily to impress upon us what's at stake beneath our preparation for reception into the Orthodox Church, those of you who are catechumens, and once received, are holding the root of the Orthodox faith firmly to the end, or to its consummation, which is theosis, our union with God. And that's those of you who have already been received, and not catechumens anymore, but you're orthodox faithful. This is for all of us. Now, I just quoted from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. You have your Hebrew study Bibles, many of you, if you'd like. Uh, let's just take some a, little, a couple minutes here, and let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. I want to translate it to you directly from the Greek. Um, this is where, you know, well, okay, you'll, you'll see 
Um, so starting with verse 14, um, he, he's talking about um, be, be, being, being diligent not to allow our hearts to be hardened so that we become like the ancient Israelites who were never allowed to enter the land of Canaan because they were always provoking the Lord with their provocativeness, their idolatry, and their rebelliousness. So he comes to verse 14, and he says, um, For we have become partakers of Christ. That's the word. Partakers or sharers of Christ. Um, we have become partakers of Christ. Now, you know, the verb to partake, doesn't that have to do with eating? You partake of a meal. Well, we're partaking of Christ. He's the tree of life. We're partaking of the fruit of the tree of life, which is Christ's body and blood. So it's a Eucharistic reference here. We have become partakers of Christ. If, he says, if. And now here's where the Greek, um, here, and here it comes, becomes rather critical what your theological doctrine is. Because your theological doctrine will dictate to you how you interpret, how you translate the Greek. If you don't have the right theological doctrine, you'll miss what the Greek is saying. And this is how I would translate it. Um, I think in the, if in the mind of the church. Um, it says, if we hold firm, in other, you know, even if we cleave, if we cleave, that's a nuptial, language, a nuptial word. If we cleave um, to the, the word is archi, the root or the beginning, um, the principle of, of the, and guess what the word is here? It's hypostasis. If we hold fast to the beginning or to the root or to the principle of, of, the, of the hypostasis, where else have we seen the word hypostasis? You know, it was in Christology, of course. Christ is the, hypost the second hypostasis of the Holy Trinity. The three persons of the Trinity are hypostases. Hypostasis is the, it, it means that which stands underneath. So it's a, it's a foundation. And the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the doctrine of the hypostases, tells us that the foundation of reality is the personal reality of, Christ, of, of the Holy Trinity. It's not an essence. It's, it's, the, it's the hypostasis. It's the person. It's the, the mystery of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the, the foundations. And the foundation of the Holy Trinity, moreover, is the Father. Because, you know, the, the Son is begotten from the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father. So that the vision of reality that's given to us in the doctrine of the Trinity, of the Church, is that reality, you know, being, whatever you want to call it, is personal. It's not essential. The foundational reality is not a what, it's a who. The who of the Father, or the who of the Son, and the who of the Holy Spirit. That means that we are all created in his image and likeness. That means that we are foundationally who's. But anyway, the other place that we found this word hypostasis, remember, was in Hebrews 11.1. 1. There he says, faith is the hypostasis. It's the it's translated into English as faith is the substance, which is what the Greek word means in Latin. Uh, you know, the substantia, that which stands underneath. It's the foundation. Faith, the, faith is the foundation of what we hope for. Uh, the evidence, the proof of, the, of things unseen. So then the, uh, what he's saying is there, well, you tell me, what's he saying now? When, now that you know that the word there is hypostos and, and not whatever, what, what some of your translations probably have confidence. If we hold fast to our confidence, um, I suppose hypostasis might mean that in other contexts. But here, no, I don't think so. Uh, you tell me now what you're hearing when you now hear this verse, um, you know, um, from what I've just um, shared with you. Um, we have become partakers of Christ. If we cleave firm, if we hold fast 
to the root or to the beginning of our of the hypostasis until it's consum until it's until its end. And the word there for end mean it has other meanings. It can mean completion. It can mean perfection. It can mean consummation. So the Greek, the Greek carries all of these meanings all at once. Now, when you're going to translate it into English, you have to choose, you know, from the range of possible meanings that the Greek carries, you're going to have to choose one of these. You can't choose all of them. So you're going to, so if you choose, and so most of our translations have tra chosen this word, the end, which is fine. But you know, to the English ear, when you hear in, end, do you also hear perfection or completion or consummation? Um, maybe dimly. Same goes for on the cross. For the what? On, on the cross at the end, what Christ says, did he say, oh. it is completed, it's perfected? I, I've heard so many different Yeah, things. Uh, you know, uh, I can't remember the Greek word. It's like, he it's, says it's finished. It's teleo. It's teleo. Is it? Is it? The telestai. Mm -hmm. Is it? There you go. Same word. Is it? I didn't realize that, Mitch. I hadn't checked that. I think so. But anyway, so what do you hear now? Think about it. What do you hear when you read this verse now um, with the uh, Greek now in the back of your mind? We become partakers of Christ if we hold firm the root or the beginning of our faith. Hypostasis. We can say faith for hypostasis. All the way until its consummation. What would you say is the root of our faith? Yeah, yeah, think about it. What's the beginning of our faith, would you say? Well, that's a good guess. <laughs> so the hypothesis would be Christ. Okay, that, that okay, I just I just nudged you along. Yeah. Got you closer. So the beginning of our faith is Christ. So elaborate. Elaborate. Okay. I've had more time to think about this than you. He's, he's the author and finisher. He's of the, the author faith. and the finisher. Okay, James. And specifically in this Eucharistic con context, he's the sacrifice. He's the um, what we hope for in partaking. All of that's in the ballpark. Everything you're saying is in the ballpark. I'm going to show, suggest this to you. What does St. John say? We love him. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. So I, I hear this to me say, you know, the beginning of our faith is actually God's love for us. His sacrifice on the cross, which was the manifestation in, in flesh, not just in theory but in the flesh of his great love for us. Um, all the way to its consummation. What would be the, all the way to its end. But is, what, so what is the end of our faith? What is its end? What is its goal? What, what, what completes it? What, and, and really the word that gives it away is this word consummation. Why? Because it's a nuptial word. What's theosis? Union with God. And Christ, we call Christ, the, in, in nuptial terms, what do we call Christ? Bridegroom. Bridegroom. The bridegroom. The bridegroom. And the human soul is the bride. The church is the bride. So we will become partakers of Christ. We will become eaters and drinkers of the body and blood of Christ, the tree of life, if we hold fast our faith. In other words, if we, if we keep ourselves rooted in the love of God for us, which will awaken in us our love and excite in us our love for Christ. And so in that love, Christ for us and us for Christ, we, will, we hold fast to, so you know, we hold fast to our faith. We hold fast to our love all the way to its consummation, which would be union with Christ. All right, so I have, um, this might be a good point, good time, to insert a couple of um, 
thoughts that came to me just this just this evening. See, just this evening before we, before I came to church, and I was thinking about this. See, the mind never never rests. Um, um, so, in light of what we've been talking about, you know that our our irreducible essence is to be with God. It's it's withness. It's withness. That's what it is to be human. Is to be with God, in communion with God. So, in light of that. Um, the, you know, and, and, and what that suggests that that I'm not that we are not really fully human, except when we are with God, when we are in union with God. So then, um, that that puts it that puts a, a certain light on what we're talking about in these classes, this winter semester Christian. So the being fully human, so that would mean that of the percentage of human beings that have ever exist of, you know, 0.001% have ever actually achieved the goal of humanity? It could be. Humanity? It could be, yes. Yes, it could be. I don't know for sure. Yeah. And I don't worry about that. I let God worry about that. Uh, but, I mean, you know, Many are called, but few are chosen. Um, and the Father's told. Yes, yeah, so, so, somebody? Present. Huh? Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're uh, breaking up. Well, anyway, moving on. So then what we're talking about here, I said it puts a different light, puts a certain light on what we're talking about here. You know, really, when you think about it, what we're talking about when we talk about the faith of the church is we're talking about um, how to become ourselves. The faith of the church is really the, uh, let's say, it's the art of becoming who you are. It's the art of becoming who you are. And that's quite different from, let's say, learning how to shoot a basketball the right way or swinging the baseball bat the right way. You can become a terrific baseball player, a terrific basketball player if you know how to shoot, if you know how to swing the bat. But it doesn't change you. Whereas this is you learning how to be yourself, your true self. So that the faith of the church is not a, f- a body of foreign teachings. It sound, may sound foreign, but that's only an indication of how far we've gotten from ourselves. How much we don't know who we are. Christian? So last week you talked about, like, don't trust yourself. Yes. So yes. Achieving humanity. Yeah. That would be when you could trust yourself. Well, so yes. Now, that will, yes, and that will be a long time from now. Yes, rather unlikely. Yes, I mean, um, even the uh, in the even the NBA players have a coach. Yes, right. I mean, don't get any better than they, than they are at that level, yes. but they still have a coach, and he still tells them what's what. Right. Yep. So, yeah, we always need a guide. The guide would be the church. We'll get into that even a bit more later. Yes, Mitch. Um, when you talk about witness as being the essence of humanity. How do you think about the the purpose or essence of like the angelic hosts or the creation or like? And mm-hmm. I feel like there's some overlap there. Do you think? That? Well, yes, but you see, they're not created in the image. Sure. Okay. To for us to be with God, you know, that's a good point, Mitch. It goes deeper than just being with. Mm-hmm. It's being in the image and in the likeness being aligned. So that gets actually to the second point that I wanted to say, that I was thinking about. That uh, So we are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Um, it's like the image, you know, that we're saying that following origin of Alexandria of the third century that we uh, quoted last week, our prime, or two, whatever it was, two weeks ago, was it last week? Our primary substance, our primary hypostasis is the word that he uses, is our having been made in the image or according to the image of God. That's our primary hypothesis. And so it's that, 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 that it's our having been made in the image. 
In other words, having been brought to be in communion with God as his image. Um, but the image then becomes the foundation, uh, the hypostasis, again using Origen's word, on which we now proceed to strive toward likeness with God, to fulfill the image and become like God. And now we are completely one with God. So um, let's 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 put a cheerier note on your on your um, your, uh, your your statement there, Christian. Um, it's not like it's not like I'm not in communion with God, and bang, I am. Okay, um, we're all moving towards full union with God, and um, some more, some less. Those, and and in as much as the image of God is what all of us are created in. I mean, it's, our, it, it's, the, it's the essence of all of us, right? So it's, it's not just my essence, but it's not his essence over there who doesn't even know about Christ. It's his essence too. And Christ is, you know, Christ, the Son of God, the Holy Trinity, is beauty, goodness. And what human being do you know that is not in love with beauty? You know, even the ancient philosophers who did not know Christ, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, Empedocles, uh, Socrates, Plato, Plotinus, they did, not, they did not become fully one with Christ, but they were in love with beauty and they sought it with all their energy. And they became beautiful men, you know, insofar as a man can become beautiful, uh, apart from God. So to that degree, there were... If they were they were attaining union with God, and who knows Is after that the idea of like the righteous pagan. Yes, okay. yes. See, Christ was. I mean, that's a beautiful point that you're making, Christian. That you know, Christ is not some message that you have to agree with. He's reality. He is the really real, and the really real is beauty. It's goodness. It's truth. It's so to the degree that we are. Um, you know, pursuing beauty, goodness, truth, to the degree that we are um, cultivating uh, love for, for the, you know, for the one, however you want to call it, and, and our neighbor. To that degree, we are, we are uh, as the, fa the fathers themselves would say, to that degree, God is becoming incarnate in us. Because God is love. Wherever love is present, there to that degree, God is incarnate. So that gets back to the point that I'm, that I'm making, that when we're studying the Orthodox Christian faith, when we're studying Christ, the mystery of Christ, we're not studying something that's alien to us, any of us, nobody. We're studying the art of becoming who we really are. James, you have a question? Um, your mention of truth, purpose, and beauty reminds me of one of my um, university classes, um, the Dr. Roland I found theology. And um, a lot of there was a lot of talk of patristics and things like that, and um, scholastics as well. But he defined truth as contact with reality. You know, um, that is as clo the closer we get to reality, the closer we exist in the more, And the more truly become. Exactly. And the less farther away, the more delusion, the more unreality we allow ourselves to exist in. He sounds like a Neoplatonist. <laughs> but that's only to say that I mean, Platonism is not all wrong. <laughs> so anyway, coming to the second point that I wanted to share with you. So we've been created in the image of God, and that's the foundation for becoming like God. That, that's our destiny, to become like God. And when we become fully like God, we become, you know, I think the fathers would say we never fully become like God. How can you become like God? He's infinite. He's, he's beyond everything. So we're always becoming like God. More and more and more. But uh, here's, the, here's the beauty of the Christian faith, that um, we, because of our transgression, we chose not to love God, we chose to love ourselves. We chose to love the, the creation as our God, as our idol. And as a result, we, were, we cut ourselves off from God. And we did not become like God. Man has become rather like the, like the ape. Like, you know, like Darwin's ape. That's what we become like. 
Um, but um, so um, for us to attain to uh, likeness was, with God, it was virtually impossible. How can you attain to likeness with God when you're separated from him? But the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the Christian faith, is that the image of God was Christ himself um, became one with us. He united himself to us. He became flesh and blood, like us. So he became, he became like us in every respect, in his union with us, in every respect except for sin. And so now, as a result of the mystery of the Incarnation in which God himself has become flesh, um, we are now united with God. God. I should say, God is united with us. And now on the basis of God's union with us, we now, if we want to, we can, you know, repent, turn around, and begin making our way towards the source of all beauty, the source of our beauty, which is God himself, and we can become, we can become like God. Because God has already become like us in, his, in the mystery of his incarnation. All right, something to think about. So, see, we're not even past line eight yet. So, we got to get moving here. So, um... As I said, the, 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 the overarching theme in these classes is the way back to the tree of life. So the tree of life is Christ. For wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. You may notice the verb, who lay hold of her. It's taking us right back to Hebrews 3, 14. Um, if we hold fast uh, to the root of our faith. In other words, if we hold fast to the root of Christ's loving us, you know, uh, so the tree of life is Christ, uh, wisdom, and wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her firmly are called blessed. So you see, he, even Solomon, who's writing this, uh, Christ was not yet incarnate, but Solomon had every hope, and he, had, he was full of joy in his hope that if he held firmly to wisdom, he would be blessed. But now we learn in the New Testament that to be blessed is to become one with God, <laughs> to be consummated in union with God. Um, and uh, we, we uh, say that we, call, we make reference here to wisdom as the tree of life because Christ is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24, he's the, he's the, uh, he's the uh, wisdom and the power of God. So, that's the first point, that the tree of life is Christ. The second point, the tree of life is found in the Garden of Eden. The church is the Garden of Eden. The church is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who is all in all. I'm setting up a, a chain of syllogism, a, a chain of uh, uh, what you call a premises. Um... So the way to the tree of life is the way into the Garden of Eden, which is the way into the Holy Orthodox Church. Which is, and the church is not a collection of people who happen to believe uh, uh, similarly. No, the church is, goes deeper than the people. The church is the crucified, buried, and risen body of Christ. That's the church. We want to become members of that body. None other. For it is in that body and in none other, no other body, that the incarnate Son of God has destroyed death by his death and given life to those in the tombs. Did any of you have a chance to read this supplement from Saint from Archimedes Athanasios? I believe he's been uh, he's canonized since. But uh, it'd be, you know, you, you might want to read that. You have that? You don't have that on there, James. I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, he's talking about, well, today we speak about the Church of Christ, yet God may not protect this Church of Christ because it is a parody and not a church. I don't think you have it, Virgin. There's a separate attachment. Thank you. Think about the number of heresies that exist and move about in the name of Christ. Are we to think that Christ serves and protects these churches? All these Western non-denominational and Protestant confessions, the so-called Christian churches. He's writing this in 1982 in Greece. 
Let us be sure that the church is one. The Orthodox Church of Christ. These so-called churches have been secularized to such a degree that one needs to hold one's nose. Uh, he was speaking uh, like I'm speaking, and somebody was recording what he was saying. That's why he's a bit free with his language. <laughs> Recently, I was reading about the establishment of a homosexual chapter in the bosom of the terribly unraveling Anglican Church. Again, this is back in the early 1980s. The homosexuals are now appealing and invoking their Christian love. I ask, is it possible for Christ to protect such inexplicable anomalies and conception? Is it possible for these anomalies to be included in this church? A few years ago, at a conference of the World Council of Churches, it was agreed not to invoke the name of the Holy Trinity, because some of the participant churches do not accept the triune God. Then what sort of Christian churches are these? This is precisely why the angel spells it out to John in the book of Revelation. Do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. Measurement means protection. Measure only the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. So, our eternal destiny is at stake here. It's more than about being nice and inoffensive. Remember that the cross is foolishness to the Greeks the Gentiles, and a scandal to the Jews. As an Orthodox Christian, we are fools to some, we are offensive to others. That was the first prefatory remark that I wanted to make. Here's the second. Now we get into the second. Again, going back to the early Syriac Christian work, the Book of Steps, the Church has three courts. There's the visible, which opens onto the invisible court of the heart, which opens onto the third court, which is the invisible court of heaven. And the Garden of Eden is the mystery of the human heart. This is from St. Callistos and Lacudis in the 14th century, from the fifth volume of the Philokalia. Visible things are images, the word is icons, depicting the invisible things of man. And thus the exceedingly beautiful Garden of Paradise, planted with all wisdom by God in the East in Eden, is an image of the inner man. His heart is the earth and soil, and the plants are the things freely planted by the intellect according to the image of God. Note that St. Callistos, writing in the 14th century, has the same understanding of the church that is given in the 4th century Liber Graduum. We read the Liber Graduum, what was it, uh, last fall in 22? I think that's when we introduced that text. But our point in bringing forward the witness of St. Callistos is this, is to say that the tree of life, Christ, to say that the tree of life, Christ, is found in the Garden of Eden, is to say that he's found within you. He's found within you. And that means that, means that you know, the really real Christ is not outside of you. He's in you. You want to find the really real? Look within yourself. But of course, we're going to need a guide to help us look into ourselves so that we don't get um, uh, distracted or, or uh, deceived. So if the Garden of Eden is the church, the mystery of the crucified, buried, and risen body of Christ, the image of God in whom you were made in the image and likeness of God, then is it not in the church that you will find your irreducible essence? Is it not because the church, again, remember the church is the body and blood of Christ, the crucified, very risen body of Christ, the image of God in whom you were made, in whom you came to be, in whom you really have your true existence. Um, is it not in the church alone that you can become a partaker of Christ, I mean, of his actual body? In Holy Eucharist, um, the tree of life and the communicant of the divine nature. So then the way back to the tree of life, back to Christ, the image of God in whom we were made, and so back to the root and the perfection of our bent, of our being and of our identity or who we are. This is another way to speak of repentance. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. Uh, meta means to change or to turn. 
Um, and noia is from the Greek word for mind, or the intellect. So repentance means turning with the mind. Turning our mind inward onto the path of the inner exodus of the gospel that leads to the tree of life in the bridal chamber that is within you. Um, this, you know, I, the, the inner exodus of the gospel, that was the substance of our catechism, uh, again, back in the fall of 22. And I have sent the attached, there's, it, come, it was written in three parts, and I've sent those three parts, I think, to all of you now, except for you guys, I haven't sent it to you. If you haven't got it and you'd like it, just let me know. I'd be happy to forward to send it to you as an attachment. But that's what I'm referring to. And when I say about talk about the inner exodus of the gospel, so this 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 give, leads us then to Saint Isaac of Nineveh in the seventh century, eighth century. Be diligent to enter into the bridal chamber that is within you. He's talking about your heart or the hidden man of the heart, and you will see the bridal chamber of heaven. For these are one and the same, and with one entry you will behold them both. The nuptial ladder of the kingdom is within you, hidden in your soul. Plunge deeply within yourself, away from sin, and there you will find steps by which you will be able to ascend. The rudimentary steps of repentance and prayer constitute the practicum that we are moving to at the end of this lecture on principles two and three under this topic, the image and the intellect. The Organs of Repentance and Prayer. So now we begin with the main body of the lecture, the presentation. Prefatory is over. Um, principle two, the image, it's a substantive icon with God, an empty idol by itself. Our topic in class one was our irreducible essence as communion with God, Following origin of Alexandria in the third century, who said our primary hypostasis is our having been made according to the image of God. Here in class two, we focus on the image itself. The biblical theology of the image is given in both the Hebrew and Greek words that we translate as image. So I'd like to start with the Hebrew. Hebrew word is selen. Trust I pronounce this so that a good Jew could understand what I just said. The Hebrew word translated as image is tselem. In Hebrew, it connotes, get this, this was, this, was, uh, this was fascinating to me. It connotes an empty image. And so a phantom, an illusion, a mere resemblance. But in Genesis 1.26, Man is created by God according to his image. And we learn in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that the image of God in whom man was created, as well as everything else, the whole world, is Christ. Christ, the invisible, the icon of the invisible God. And Christ is the wisdom of God. He's the very character of the Father's apostasis. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And he uses that word, apostasis, in chapter 1, verse 3. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, if you have your Orthodox study Bibles, you just want to follow along. Uh, you can, we'll see if you can find wisdom. Chapter 7, verse 26. Um, in, in wisdom, it says, For wisdom is the brightness of the everlasting light. I like to translate it as the effulgence. The effulgence, because that's what the Greek word means. It, it's talking about something that's pouring out, like water from a fountain. So this is this is an effulgence, a, 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 a light, an uncreated light that is constantly radiating outward. Uh, for she is the effulgence, the outpouring of the eternal light um, and the image of his goodness. Um, and then Hebrews, so that's what Hebrews is referring to when it says, um, for he it uses it uses the very same word that is found here in the Septuagint in wisdom. He is the effulgence, the outpouring of the glory of the Father, and he is the very character of his hypostasis, of his person. It means that he's he, you know, he's just 
I don't know how to translate it, actually. It means that he's he, he, he's the exact um, resemblance. I mean, you know, he, you look, like he says to Philip in the upper room, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He's not the Father. He's distinct from the Father, but he's the exact character, the exact representation of the Father. And so Christ is not empty. Christ is substantive as the image of God. He is the substance. And in fact, in Hebrews 10.1, it says, and this is interesting, that the law was a shadow of the good things to come. Um, it was not itself, and guess what the word is? It's icon. It was not itself the icon of those realities. It says realities. It doesn't say of those ideas, of those problems, of those pragmatic concrete realities, um, so that the icon is the measure, you know, it's the substantive uh, measure of truth. It's the, sub, it's the foundation of truth. And truth comes from the, from the image that is Christ. Um, so, and Christ, moreover, is filled with the Father's own substance and with the uncreated radiance of the Father's eternal brilliance. And then we saw from Ecclesiasticus, or Jesus ben Sirach, this was back in Lecture 1, and it was lines 70 and 71, we saw how uh, Sirach, in Sirach's vision, the wisdom of the Father was rooted in man from the beginning. I wonder if it'd be useful to just go back to that. It says in, in Jesus ben Sirach, I, wisdom, took root in an honorable people, even in the portion of the Lord's inheritance. And our point that we made in reference to that was to show that not only was man created, um, rooted in Christ, the image of God, but the image of God, Christ, the wisdom of God, was rooted in us, was rooted in man. It goes both ways. Creating man in his own image, in Christ, God creates man as an image, as an icon of his very own properties. Again, this takes us to Wisdom chapter 2, verse 23, where it says, uh, God created man to be immortal and made him to be, and, and you know, to, and made, it, it, the Greek here too, it, 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 it's very, it, it's hard to bring out in the English the beauty of the Greek. Uh, he, he made him, he made him, he made him um, uh, of his own, the, his own things, um, his own personal things. I mean, the word is, is idiom, um, idiom, you know, his own very intensely personal, you know, like your idioms, you're an idiomatic. You know, there's the part of you that's yourself, no one else. You're idiom, we're all idiomatic. That's what, that's what it's talking about. That which is is distinctly and uniquely you. So he's saying that he has made us um, in the image of his own selfness. I mean, his own, you know, his own personal idio, idio, idiomatic self. That's how intimate the image is, or the, our being created in the image of God. Um, so man is therefore not created as a mere resemblance. He is not created as a phantom or an empty illusion because he is created in God's own immortality, in his own intensely personal properties. And this makes me think that the funeral dirge that we hear at an Orthodox funeral, the funeral hymn composed by St. John of Damascus in the 8th century, the hymn begins, uh, what is this mystery concerning us? How is it that we have been wedded unto death? And I think what's behind that is this, Wisdom 2.23. How is it that we have been wedded unto death when we were created in the image of God's own immortality? What has happened? It's an unfathomable, you know, tragedy. And again, God's own immortality, wisdom, as I said before, is rooted in the soil of man's primary substance. Substance. So I hope that you're getting that was what that the, that the picture that's being drawn in your mind right now is somehow is, is some kind of a of, a, of an image that 
that, that in which you can feel, if not see, how, how close, how intimate um, is the relationship between man and God at his primordial root. How intimate we are with God. And that's what it is to be human, to be intimate with God. Um, man created in the image of God, according to all that that means in the biblical doctrine of man, means that the image of God, Christ, God the Son, the only begotten, you know, before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, he's uncreated. It means that this Son of God, the image of God in whom we were made, it means that that image can dwell in us. So again, St. John Damascus, what is this mystery concerning us? That we are wedded unto death. When the immortal Son of God, when we can be wedded to the immortal Son of God and become immortal. Um, and it, be, it means that the image of God can dwell in us because we are his image. And it means that he can dwell in us bodily. That's what St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. And again, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Um, but that also means that the wisdom and image of God can become flesh and dwell among us. And it's not alien to him. But it means that the garment of our own human nature fits him. Which means that our human nature can be infinitely enlarged so that the garment of his uncreated glory can fit us. I suggest that this is something to think about. Who are you? Who are you? Where are you going to go to find out who you are? This is what the Bible is telling us, who we are. How many of us even begin to appreciate this, or even begin to understand this? Um, to how many of us is Christ just an idea that you argue about? Either believe him or you don't. <laughs> you know, this, this just shatter that to smithereen. There is a deep, deep, deep mystery here concerning us. How we have been made in the image of God's own immortality, and yet we're wedded unto death. So, but when the Spirit of God departs, from us, then man, fashioned from the earth, is in the likeness of the flower that comes forth from the earth and withers. Now man is in the likeness of a breath, his days are in the likeness of a passing shadow. Now man is a mere resemblance of God. Now he's a phantom. James. Um, so we've become wedded death by our own sins. Yes. We have the same distinct personhood. Yes. Partaken. Is that part of the reason why Christ had to wed himself to death yes. on the cross to save us? Yes, he's not a message. Because <laughs> understand what you're what you're what you're saying is that the our purpose is to become one with God, not just to believe him. Like St. James says the devil's belief it doesn't do them any good. They just tremble. So just like we were talking about earlier with Sophia, just as when we become closer to God, we partake in Him, He also partakes in us. This gets to that one second point that I was making that's not included here, that that can happen now to us, because Christ, even though we're not like Him because of our sin, um, Christ has become like us, and has united Himself to us, even though we're not united to Him. And because He has united Himself to us, He's become the new foundation of our life, of everyone's life. So what uh, um, it takes me back to, and we'll, we'll look at it at the practicum in the practicum too, but this takes us back to the a comment I made in the first lesson that said that, I said that um, the, uh, you know, this inner exodus of the gospel, this, this path that leads to the bridal chamber of the heart where we can become one with God is um, real and it is immediately accessible to everyone. Because it's not out there. It's not an idea that you have to read about and understand well enough so that you can believe it and understand it. It's Christ who is the very principle, if you will, of your being, the very root of your being. And he has, 
And he has established himself now in us. And so, as I say, he has become the new foundation, the new root. We Things now are new. But what do we say? Don't we say that in the church? Now all things are new. Now all things are new because Christ is now one of us. And so if we want to, we can now become one with Christ, become like Christ, if we want to. The way is open to everyone. Everyone. So um, outwardly, uh, uh, without the, without apart from God, when the Spirit of God departs, then outwardly we appear beautiful. Because, you know, well, we appear beautiful, but imagine what we actually looked like in the garden before we were separated from God, and then our bodies began to, uh, you know, suffer from decay and corruption and, you know, uh, cripplings and uh, deformities of all kinds. And, you know, we were, you know, we were, we were beautiful, even in our body. But uh, outwardly now, we can still appear beautiful. But it's the beauty of a, a like a whitewashed tomb, as the Lord himself says. Whereas inwardly, the man who is made in the Im an image of God's own eternity is full of dead bones and uncleanness. So the Lord's word through the psalmist, I say you are God, sons of the Most High, yet you die like men, you fall like any prince. That's actually a funeral dirge. Taken up, I think, by St. John of Damascus in our own Orthodox funeral uh, service. When he says, what is this mystery concerning us? How is it that we are wedded unto death? We have become an empty resemblance, a phantom. Beneath our beauty and form, our naked bones, we are free food for the worms and stench. And that's not how we were made. We were made so that beneath our form, there would be the eternal light of God just pouring out. And there would be the, you know, the light of, his, of incorruptibility, immortality, that would just be radiating from us in our union with Christ. But now Genesis 2.7 begins to make sense, you know, in this, in this, under, in this Hebrew understanding of Selem. So uh, we can take a look at that. Um, when it says, when it says, uh, and uh, God fashioned the man from the clay of the earth, or from, of clay from the earth. And he breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living Soul it says a living psyche in the in the Greek. We translate it as soul in the Hebrew. Um, but anyway, we'll touch on the Hebrew in just a minute and the Greek. Uh, but now, when we read Genesis two seven in the light of uh, what we just learned about the Hebrew understanding of uh, of the image uh, as empty without God, an empty idol without God, but truly substantive with God. Now that begins to re now two seven begins to reveal its theological depth. You notice that in Genesis 2.7, man does not become a living soul. He does not become substantive. He is not more than a mere resemblance of God until God breathes into him the breath of life, the Holy Spirit. The theological depth here opens up even more in the Hebrew word that's translated as soul. But I think we need also to talk about the Greek word that's translated as soul. Psyche. The Hebrew word and the Greek word each presuppose a particular anthropological vision quite different from each other. Our self-understanding really has been shaped by the Greek word psyche, and it is not biblical. Um, I want to talk about the Greek word so we can be made aware of how our understanding of ourselves and of God needs to be corrected. So the Greek word is psyche. You know that word well from psychosis, psychology, psychiatry, da 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 da, -da. Um, Psyche is the Greek word translated as soul. Historically, the psyche referred to the living fluids, including the semen, of course, but not the blood, as, uh, I, I think. You know, I, I read this, I, I studied this some years ago, and the details have gotten fuzzy. Um, so I might have the details a bit uh, mixed up. But anyway, it, the, the, the psyche is the fluid, the living fluid, the, the waters of life that flow through the body. And there are certain places in the body where this living fluid is, where, where it collects, like the elbows, the hips, you know, other places like that. That's why in the uh, Greek mythology, you see Zeus giving birth to somebody from his hip, from his elbow, from his shoulder, because that's where the living fluid, the, psych the psychic fluids 
collect. Um, but the, the point here is that uh, the anthropological view behind the Greek word, or the, 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 yeah, the, the, the word psyche, is, 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 is the, the psyche in the Greek philosophical and mythological mind is immortal and divine in its essence and in its origin. So it is the life of the gods flowing through us. The anthropological view behind the Greek word psyche then is that in our soul, your psyche, we are by nature gods. We are immortal and divine by nature. That's the point that I want you to see. Nefesh is the Hebrew word translated as soul. Its root meaning is the throat. So Genesis 2.7 reads literally in the Hebrew, God breathed into Adam's face the breath of life, and man became a living throat. Yeah, sounds weird, doesn't it? Until you start to think about it. If we are a living throat, well, what does that mean in terms of what we need in order to live? We need food, water, and air. We're completely dependent. We're not gods in and of ourselves. We are these creatures who need food, water, and air to live. So then in the biblical vision, man is not an inherently immortal divine soul, as the Greek psyche would indicate if allowed to speak in its native environment of Hellenic philosophy. Man is nefesh. He's a throat. He lives only as he eats, drinks, and inhales God. He lives eternally only as he eats and drinks and inhales the eternal life of God. So you see, we are what we eat. We are what we breathe. We are what we drink. But now you see the Lord's command to eat from the tree of learning good and evil, but not to eat from the tree of learning good and evil, but from the tree of life makes sense. Uh, then I have this quote from uh, Ecclesiasticus. I just wanted to uh, put the whole quote in there because it gives such a beautiful description of the tree of life as this vibrant, fragrant tree that emits this beautiful fragrance throughout the whole garden. Um, but down to line 144, the tree of learning good and evil is the creation. More specifically, it is the body's power of sensation, following St. Maximus. In itself, the tree of learning good and evil is good and beautiful, for it is created by God, following St. Ephraim the Syrian from the 4th century, and other fathers too. St. Ephraim isn't the only one who teaches that. But it is created in God. So following from Ecclesiasticus, in this quote that I gave from line 131 to 143, um, the uh, tree of learning good and evil derives its fragrant beauty and goodness only in union with wisdom, the tree of life. Separated from God, separated from the tree of life, its beauty then becomes that of the flower of the field, here today, gone tomorrow. And like the flower, when it decays, man, when he grows old and dies, and is bereft of his youthful beauty and form, is discovered to be naked bones, food for the worms, and stench. I'm quoting from the funeral hymn. So man as nephesh, as throat. No, throat means, means the whole area, the whole area of the line, all this area. Man as nephesh means that every aspect of his being is like the throat. His soul and all of its faculties and powers the mind, the desiring, the insensitive powers, all of these function according to their nature only as they eat and drink and inhale God, each in the manner that is appropriate to it. The mind, for example, is filled with knowledge and wisdom. It is illumined only as the thoughts and understandings that it eats and drinks are those of the fruit of the tree of life, the wisdom that is advised the true light, the radiance of the Father's glory. Partaking of Christ, the wisdom and knowledge of God, man knows the inner essences of all things. How does this not mean that to know the world truly in a scientific way is to know it theologically in Christ? 
And I was just reading, I think it was from Proverbs, this beautiful place, this beautiful verse, I think it's Proverbs or Psalms, it says you know, that, the, that God founded the earth in his wisdom. Understand, that means that the whole earth, the whole world, all of reality is grounded, not in chance, you know, the kaleidoscopic configuration of atoms or whatever, but it's grounded in wisdom. Which, of course, is, is, is what St. Paul probably is drawing from when he writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ is the icon of the invisible God, in whom, for whom, and by whom all things were created, and in whom all things go here. Which is to say that the root of everything cannot be discerned, you know, with our own uh, human instruments of measurement. Whether, like the Lord says, judge not according to appearances, to judge not according to phenomena, but judge with true judgment. In other words, understand the world <laughs> not according to what you see and observe, that's phenomena, but rather according to the mystery of Christ, which is the truth of God. Everything is rooted in God. Um, from the foods that we eat, we exude certain odors, do we not? If the foods that our mind, our soul, and our body are eating are the fruits of wisdom, which, by the way, is, refers up to line 141. That's a mistake in the text. Our whole being, our words, our disposition and character, our deeds and behaviors will exude the fragrance of the tree of life, Christ the Lord. And this is exactly what we see in the saints and the church. In the church, in other words, in the mystical reality of the Garden of Eden, Christ gives his body and blood, the fruits of the tree of life, for us to eat and drink. Eating of it, we shall not die like Adam, we say. That's what the priest is saying as he's fracturing the host, as he's preparing to distribute it to all the faithful. For the body of Christ is divided, yet not disunited, it is eaten, yet never consumed, but sanctifying those who partake thereof. And you understand that the Lord not only gives us food and drink to eat with our mouths and our stomach, but he also gives us food and drink to eat and drink with our minds. You know, in the teachings of the church, in the, uh, he, in the, in the, in the, in the Holy Scriptures, the, uh, the teachings of the Holy Fathers. Uh, he gives to us um, food, and he gives to our emotions and to our feelings, to our soul, food and drink in the prayers of the church. So that as we're doing the things of the church, as we're living the life of the church, we're eating and drinking Christ with our mind, our soul, our body. And to the degree that we do that more and more, we begin to exude the, oh, the fragrance of Christ. And I don't know. Maybe you've noticed it. I don't know. You know, you go to some of you. Know, I go to the Y, and I see these these Cree, these Cree characters, <laughs> and it's like you. It's like there's a there's a there's a darkness. There's a shadow that just. It's like they their their whole their whole being is in shadow, and, and I don't. I look at them closely, and I I don't see a shadow, but I they're so dingy, so dreary, and then you get close to them, and there's a. It's like you can smell. I smell more closely. And there's, I'm not smelling anything, but it's just this something that exudes. Whereas I have, uh, you know, I remember in particular when uh, Katie was, was it, I think it was, yeah, it was Katie, our number five was born. We were in the hospital. Um, Nancy had just given birth to her. I think it was Katie. Maybe it was Nicholas. And uh, the door opened up. No, thought to the room, and in comes Father Ted. Oh, he was the uh, head priest at the cathedral at that time. That's where I was as the assistant. And I looked to the door, and he was. It was like this. It was this like uh, this this flame of light. <laughs> Honestly, he, he he was just glowing. He's a priest. <laughs> he just glowed as he came in. There was just a cleanness about him, and it was such a joy to welcome him into the room and have him say prayers over our child. That just didn't, you know that. You know, what I'm saying is that there's something to this. There's something to this. Um, where am I? Okay. So then, uh, this is the mystery of the church's holy Eucharist, foreseen by the son of Sirach. This, this, this formula that the priest says, uh, divided yet not disunited, and eaten yet never consumed, but sanctifying those who partake thereof. Um, this takes us to the son, to the to Ecclesiasticus, or Jesus ben Sirach. He says, they that eat me, that's wisdom, the tree of life, shall yet be hungry. And they that drink me shall yet be thirsty. 
which we can now understand to mean that even as the Lord fills our desire with good things, following from Psalm 102, 103, verse 5, uh, we shall never grow weary of them. And will always desire to love him who first loved us, to love him even more. All right. Um, so then let's skip down, because let's, let's, let's finish this icon and idol, starting at verse uh, line 191, and then we'll have to call it a, 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 a night. And we'll pick it up at uh, line 225 next week and go into the practical. When I hope everything now will start to, to come together. Um, the Greek word translated as image is icon, ikona. The Greek icon, too, is loaded with theology. So let me cite from Father Maximus Constus' Art of Seeing to make this point. I was quoting him. Beyond their artistic differences, the idol and the icon indicate two modes of being, variations in the mode of visibility, which gave shape to variations in the mode of divine apprehension. The idol delights in physical existence and the delight we experience in vision itself. And its highest aim is to make that delight perceptible to us. In concretizing the splendor of the visible, the idol dazzles and so arrests our vision, confining it within a closed self-referential system, allowing us to see nothing outside of itself. I'm thinking of a very drastic um, example. I'm afraid I, I hesitate, but honestly, if you'll understand now what he, what Saint Father Maximus is saying, if you apply his words to, let's say, pornography. There's the idol. Does not the the pornographic image dazzle and arrest our vision and confine us confines us within a closed self-referential system you can't see outside of it you don't particularly want to allowing us to see nothing outside itself the idol consequently reduces the divine to the measure of the human gaze arresting the movement of ascent precisely at the threshold of the invisible in other words where that uh, visible image you know, which, which carries all of these invisible forces, but where that invisible image or that visible image becomes invisible, um, it stops. It stops our vision right there. And we're just contained within the, 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 the vision, wrestling with all of those spiritual forces that it has, that it has worked up in us. Um, the icon, on the other hand, aims neither to satiate vision nor to restrict it to a particular point, but to free it by confronting it with the invisible, proposing to it the vision that the boundaries of the possible are wider than they seem. Do not judge according to appearances, Judge with true judgment. In using images to overthrow the power of images, in using icons to overthrow the power of images, the icon seeks to disrupt habituated ways of seeing, to subvert the hegemony of naturalistic representation, and so summon the eye to a new mode of vision, by opening it up to an infinite depth. God is not a finite object that we can hold within our vision, but an infinite mystery, an inexhaustible personal plenitude that always has something more to reveal to us in an endless transformation from glory to glory. If man is an empty image, then he is an putting the Greek and the Hebrew together now. He delights in his own beauty. He rests in himself. And so he returns to the dust from which he was taken. You know what this made me think of as I was thinking about this, writing this? Myself in junior high. 
junior high culture. We're all a bunch of idols walking around, expecting everybody else to worship us. Worship me. Aren't you glad you're out of that? But if man is an icon in the icon of God, if the fullness of God dwells in him bodily, his delight and his life extend beyond himself, and he comes to rest in God, in the luminous glory of God's eternal life, and man himself now becomes an icon whose beauty reveals the beauty of God. Because man becomes a partaker of Christ and a communicant of the divine nature. All right, let's end it there. And let's pick it up at uh, line 225 next week. And we'll go into the practicum, practicum two, um, which will uh, take us, if not the uh, we, we, it, I, I'm surprised if we'll get through the practicum next week. We might take two more lessons to get through the practicum. Do um, you have any questions, observations, comments that you'd like to make before we close it up? So practicum, is that the stuff that we've been doing? Is it practicum? Or? It should say practicum at the top. It should be. Um, I sent it out this morning. I, I sent it out as a separate attachment this morning. So it should be in your inbox. James? Um, I remember reading a paper on um, uh, Virgil and his connections with um, Christian revelation. Like that, and of course, that he was one of the greatest Roman pagan poets. Um, but he, in a lot of his writings, he prefigured Christ, he almost prophesied Christ in his famous um, uh, fourth epilogue, which reads exactly like Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy. Um, and speaking of this Christ as reality, there was a comment in this paper that people have wondered, you know, how could Virgil have come up with this idea that was so close to the Christian revelation, you know, it talks of a, a baby descending to heaven who will wipe away the sin of man and, and lambs will lie down with lions and things like that. Um, how could he have had this amazing revelation? Was it some ecstatic vision? Did he just stumble across and he was thinking about some other Roman figure? Um, but the writer specifically said that Virgil was such an amazing writer who was such in great contact with beauty and with truth and with goodness mm -hmm. that he couldn't have helped to have stumbled upon Christ because he was in such close connection with reality itself, which is Christ, um, that he couldn't have helped but have spoken and write, written about. Confirms that, that Christ is, is the really, really real. Yes. He's what's most natural. What's, what's most natural. So, you know, when you're coming into the Orthodox Church, I mean, honestly, you're not coming into something alien or foreign. You're coming into the very heart of creation. This is what it's all about. Where's Alfie, you know? This is what it's all about. And like I said, here we are learning the art of being who we are. We're not learning a message. We're hearing a proclamation. And the proclamation is directing us. Where is it directing us? into the hidden man of your own heart. And we'll talk more about that next week. Unless my mind keeps going, you know. <laughs> we might have to add some more things, but I do really want to just stick to this and get that done next week or two. All right, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Purely it is me to bless you, the Lord, the blessed and most pure of the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compared than the seraphim, without corruption dost thou give birth to God the Word. Truth that all folks we magnify. Christ is in our midst. He is the never shall be. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God forever. All right, see you next. See you again, whenever we see you again. <laughs>